Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the conversation with our special guests and guests of honor. I'm Elaine Vietz, and I write the uh, Angela Richmond Death Investigator Mysteries and also the Dead End Job Mysteries. But let me tell you about our special guests, and if you have any questions, let me know and I'll ask them. Allison Galen is an international bestseller who was nominated for the Mystery Writers of America's Edgar Award four times. Her thriller, If I Die Tonight, won the Edgar for Best Paperback Original. Allison says she worked very long ago as a reporter for a supermarket tabloid where she developed a lifelong fascination for writing about people doing despicable things. And Sujata, I've known Sujata since she used to bring her babies to the Malice Domestic Conference in a stroller. And they're in college, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they were adorable and they still are. Uh, Sujata is another international best-selling author and her novels have won the Agatha, Lefty and McCavity Awards. And she's also been a finalist for the Edgar, Anthony and Mary Higgins Clark Prizes. Her uh, mystery and suspense fiction is set in pre-independence India, and she has a modern mystery series set in Japan. So let's start with Allison. Your new novel, The Collective, is coming out in hardcover in November, right? Yes. Is this a novel of revenge? Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it's, it's a novel of revenge and obsession. Um, it's, uh, it centers around a woman whose uh, child, uh, whose 15-year-old daughter um, was uh, killed, um, the death blamed on a, um, a, on a college frat boy when she went to a fraternity party, and uh, he was never, uh, never really received punishment for it. In fact, was acquitted. Um, her whole life has, this happened five years ago, her life has sort of been destroyed by then. She's just, just barely surviving. She's so filled with rage. She's consumed by it. And she finds um, a number of like-minded women online on the dark web who are sort of um, all helping each other out uh, as far as solving this rage and, and releasing this rage and getting uh, a type of revenge. Um, whether that's a good or a bad thing, it's up to the reader, and I can't reveal too much because uh, there are a lot of, uh, hopefully, a lot of surprises in it. Well, it sounds fascinating. Sujata, your novel, The Flower Master, won the McCavity Award for Best Mystery Novel in 2000, and then you made us wait 19 years until you came out with another award-winning novel, your first pervy mystery novel, The Widows of Malabar Hill. So what were you doing during those missing years? Well, I did publish 11 books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was busy with, with my books. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things that was interesting is I moved from my home base, which is Baltimore, to uh, Minnesota for about six years. Mm -hmm. And that shift sort of got me in this new energy plus my um, previous publisher of my Ray Shimura books um, decided they didn't want more of, of that um, series. So I was in a new place and sort of the new ideas started percolating and I began writing historical mysteries set in India. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Allison, you collaborated with Megan Abbott on the graphic novel, Normandy Gold. Is it easier or harder than writing a novel to work on a graphic novel? Well, it was a really, it was a completely different experience, um, especially also since it's the really the, um, one of two collaborations I've ever done. The other one was I co-wrote a, a short story with Laura Littman that was in a recently uh, published uh, anthology. Mm -hmm. um, but but writing a graphic novel is, um, I think it's a little, it's it's weirdly freeing because it's so constraining. Uh, instead of community, when you're writing a script for a graphic novel, what you're mainly doing is sort of, you have um, dialogue and you have captions, which are very, very small. Um, and uh, but what you're largely doing is communicating with an artist as to what you want the images to look like. So Megan and I were able to we 
our graphic novel, Normandy Gold, uh, is sort of in the vein of a lot of 70s conspiracy thrillers, which we're both big fans of. So we were able to just take stills of films like The Parallax View or, or uh, Three Days of the Condor or Clute and just put them in there and saying, we want it to look like that. So so it's kind of, it's sort of, it's almost like uh, writing storyboards or directing more than actually writing. Um, and you're really very um, focused on telling a story in as, as, as visually as you possibly can. So it was just, it was a challenge and it was really, really fun, but a completely different experience from writing a novel. Did it help you in your novel writing when you went back to novels? I think it did in that it sort of um, helped me kind of distill things down to what kind of story do you want to tell, you know, um, out of all the superfluous uh, stuff that you put in a novel, um, you know, you got to boil it down to the, your main goal is to tell a good story and, and how are you going to do that and what tools do you have, but it did make me appreciate some of the tools that you have in novel writing that you don't have in, in writing a graphic novel, such as narrative voice, um, you know, uh, many characters, descriptions, background, uh, more dialogue than just like two little lines, you know, uh, <laughs> per panel. Um, you've got room, you have space to kind of roam around in and sort of create this whole world, uh, mm -hmm. which I kind of took for granted, I think, before we wrote the graphic novel. Okay. Sujata, your Indian, <coughs> excuse me, detective, Purveen Mystery, uh, is she based on a real person? Well, Purveen is, a, is sort of a combination of India's first two women lawyers. One was a mm -hmm. solicitor named Cornelia Sarabji, and the other um, was a barrister named Mithan Tata. And they both had in common that they had ties to a minority religious group, the Zoroastrians, um, who are called Parsis if they're in India. Today actually is the Parsi New Year. So it's a happy time for, for everybody. And um, so they had this similar background. They both happened to study at Oxford. They studied mm -hmm. law at Oxford. And then they went to work in um, Bombay and it was really difficult for women lawyers to be hired, as you could imagine, probably also here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, they spent, you know, one of them spent a whole <laughs> lot of time um, advocating for the rights of women and children. And the other lawyer, um, woman lawyer, spent a whole lot of time trying to change laws to empower all women in India. <laughs> So there was a whole lot of great work that came out. And fortunately, there are memoirs and biographies that I use to sort of get ideas for potential cases. So nothing is completely modeled on these people, mm -hmm. but the work that they did sort of as a guideline for my heroine, Praveen Mystery, who is a young Parsi woman, practices with her father and is both a strong feminist and independence advocate and somebody interested in helping people around her. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question here, <coughs> it's for Sujata. Is Parsi related to the Farsi language spoken in Iran and Afghanistan? You're muted, Sujata. Okay, you know you're muted. All right. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I'm muted. Oh, here. Okay, great. I'm back. Can you hear All me? All right. <laughs> okay. All with that big suspense. <coughs> no. So my my immediate answer is no. Farsi is a language. It's one of a couple of languages spoken, or maybe more than a couple of languages spoken in in Iran. Um, the language that the Parsi people speak in India is Gujarati, that they mm -hmm. moved over to Gujarati, which is an Indian language and English. And they also speak this, they have this language Avestan, this very old language, which is almost mm -hmm. like a Latin or a Sanskrit, but for the prayers. Um, and so Parsi means a it, 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 it means Persia in India. Mm -hmm. So that is how they are identified in India. Okay. 
Now, Allison, tell us about this lifelong fascination about writing about people who do despicable things. What <laughs> triggered that? <laughs> well, um, that actually that came out of a bio that I sort of wrote for a joke, and it's been it's been used all over online. I, I so <laughs> I, now I have to like, justify it somehow. Um, the, <laughs> I, that actually came because I said, you know, when I, as you mentioned earlier, I did uh, have a job really when I was, before I went to graduate school, right out of college, uh, I was a reporter for the Star, which was, you know, a supermarket tabloid and like there's Star Magazine now, but that's much classier than, than it was when I, when I worked there. It's, it's, it's very, it's like Vanity Fair compared to the Star I worked for. And um <laughs> I, uh, I, it was quite an adventure for me. And so I said that my experience of doing that made me develop a lifelong fascination with uh, of writing about people doing despicable things. Cause that's what every story was about. Everybody was doing despicable things. Um, but I think all, all of us crime writers uh, like to do that. Uh, we like to turn over the rock and look underneath. And, and that's why I like to read uh, crime fiction a lot is I find that it's, a, it's an escape um, from my own life, but not in the same way, say, right, reading a beautiful romance novel might be. It's an escape in that I'm escaping to somewhere worse, and then I can come back to my own life and think, wow, I've got <laughs> so, so I don't know. I think it's, I, I've always liked to kind of um, to push boundaries. I've always liked to scare myself. That's always been a goal um, that I've had uh, in writing books that that's kind of uh, changed over the years. What scares me uh, when I was first publishing my first books, it was more along the lines of, I don't know, serial killers, you know, now as I've gotten older, um, it's, uh, you know, uh, I wrote a book called uh, If I Die Tonight, and um, that was about raising teenagers. That might be the scariest um, thing ever for anybody. <laughs> um, but to me, <laughs> the things that scare me are definitely more close to home. And uh, uh, the idea of not truly knowing somebody um, that that you love or that is your child or that is your parents, uh, the idea of losing your family, um, the idea of you know grief and, and loss and things that we all inevitably do face are really the scariest things, I think, to write about. So um, uh, that was a little bit of a digression, but uh, writing about people doing despicable things probably makes me feel better as a person because they're things I'd never do, but I wouldn't <laughs> write about that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wanted to say, if, it, if yes. I could, I also have a journalism background. Mm -hmm. um, I worked uh -huh. at a daily newspaper for five years. Mm -hmm. And so when I read your work, Allison, and I, I understand that it's connected to true crimes that you're interpreting a different way and what if -ing. And I think about what I do is what's fascinating for me is true events in history and yeah. true laws. Like, uh, you know, I came across this reading the history of, you know, marital and divorce law. And I came across this law that um, Parsis could not get divorced, even in the case of physical abuse uh that, that like you know unless you lost an eye or you lost a limb but like oh beating God. and burning and oh. you know broken bones that was not enough oh and so God. the fact that this law existed and that i had found this that i had done my research that just built a whole book yeah yeah i think that's what um that what makes your books so great and i think it's what makes a lot of you know crime fiction books so great is you'll you will find these things you will relate to them personal personally and you and you you have a passion for them and then it comes across in your writing um and it's something that you it's sort of infectious you know to your readers so uh, i think that's true whether you're writing historical novels um like uh, sujata or or more current stuff as I do, it's all about kind of, you know, reading things and connecting with them on a personal way and wanting to share that, that with people. Absolutely. And I think we all connect with marriage laws, uh, it, particularly those that are in the past, but even some that are, are, are now, you, you cannot still believe they're on the, on the books. Yeah. Now, yeah. Sujata, The Widows of Malabar Hill has been optioned for development as a TV series by Village Roadshow Entertainment, which is a big deal. Can you tell us what's happening? Well, it was um, like a ex really exciting process because mm -hmm. initially there were a lot of offers from 
all over the world, like not like Canada, India, um, Italy. So it was just a re it was a really interesting experience for me to kind of move very, very slowly to find the right partner and go back and forth. And there, then there's this big question, and I think this is important because a lot of people right now are being offered a contract. It's like it's everywhere I, I look, friends are suddenly getting offers. And one of the things that can happen is um, a writer can be told, well, it's going to be for everything you ever write. Or it's going to be, we own your character. So that means we can do all these different things with your character. Mm -hmm. Think about what happened to Tony Hillerman. He sold his rights to his character a long time ago for just a few thousand dollars. And he couldn't have anything made. Like the people, they just kind of blocked it and nothing ever mm -hmm. happened with it. So it's like a very high risk um, decision for a writer to make. And um, the one thing I did that I was that I'm really really pleased about is that I only sold the option for the first book, so that means that if nothing is ever made, I can still do things with the other books. It means they can't, you know, take her being mystery and put her in the year 2020. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's all kinds of things, and I'm a um, executive producer on it, so I'm in a stage right now where I'm reading. Um, you know, the, I guess, I think it's called the Bible or, or it's at the very beginning kind of pitch that they're working on and mm -hmm. giving input into it. And, you know, there's some things they make up that, you know, that to create it to be more somatic that are wonderful. And then there are other things that I have to think about, oh, would that, does that really make sense for my character in the period? So I'm grateful to be with this group and to have this opportunity. And also the whole thing is pretty much woman led, which is really exciting um, to, to be in that kind of a space. Allison, anything for you? Any um, options? Well, yeah, um, If I Die Tonight has been optioned. Um, it's, it's actually in its second year of the option now by Sony and uh, Chris Morgan Entertainment. Um, and uh, but it is like, it is a slow process. And, and actually, as, as Sujata was saying, I mean, just in terms of negotiating the contract, it took like close to a year. So it's still in like very early phases. Um, and uh, the collective has uh, three different uh, production companies interested in it right now mm -hmm. and kind of making offers. So I'm kind of crossing my fingers that 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 turns out well, that's the book that's coming out in November. So that's kind of exciting for me. Um, the other time, only other time I worked um, or had any like sort of TV or movie interest was on Normandy Gold, um, the one I did with Megan, and we uh, that was optioned for a time by New Regency, and Megan and I wrote a pilot for it. So that was in a whole different other type of of writing, um, and you know we got relatively far with it, but I don't think it never got made, you know. But it was still kind of a it was an interesting experience and we did have to do a lot of pushing back um you know we, we it wasn't an all female uh production company i wish it was that sounds wonderful sujata uh, we had to do a lot of explaining about no our heroine is not going to have a teddy bear that she holds no oh. that was actually the thing <laughs> This is a, this is a woman who just like infiltrates the Washington D.C. call girl ring and just just it's she's like Lee Marvin and point blank she just kills people trying to find out who killed her sister. It's just like one of she's like Dirty Harry, right? And they <laughs> wanted to soften her up by having her have a, a, a teddy bear, and we're like, oh, no, wow. absolutely not, <laughs> no. I don't. Maybe it wouldn't happen today. It was a couple of years ago, you know. <laughs> but it's, okay. Oh, an all-woman production company. <laughs> that sounds so wonderful. Yeah. I can't say it really is. Every woman in the production company is, yeah. but like the the producers are are women. You know, like the the people that I'm dealing with are women. So that's perfect. Like, that's great. I mean, just to have that understanding of like sort of what you're trying to do, but um, but yeah, it's it's very exciting when you when you do have that kind of interest, and I do think there's a lot more opportunity for writers in general these days because of all the streaming and because of all the eyes in front of TVs and and you know just all the opportunity for that. So it's exciting. 
Well, this is a question for both of you. Um, what advice would you give your younger self, Sujata, when you were just starting out? I mean, you obviously did very well. I think you, you got an Agatha with your first book, but uh, what advice would you tell yourself now? Well, I think that I, I, I would encourage somebody to work at a job when they get mm -hmm. out of college, like not to immediately go into the fiction writing world. And you, you really need something interesting to say. You need to have that experience of observing things that other people haven't observed. You need to become an expert in something. You know, whether you are um, working in healthcare or whether you're working at a bookstore. Um, actually, I think bookstores are, they seem to have a very good track record for people working in the bookstores, quietly writing and getting agents and contracts. I mean, mm -hmm. I just have one of my you know, one of somebody my daughter's age is is already got um, a contract, and she went to work at a bookstore after college. You know, she studied writing and loved it, and but she went to work at a bookstore. So, or what about a library? I mean, I think they're all different kinds of things. Don't be afraid to work at something else, and don't be afraid to write an hour every day. Good advice, Allison. What would you tell your younger self? I think, yeah, I think not to be in so much of a hurry and to experience life, which is sort of along the lines that Sujata said, I think the more, I think the more you can uh, sort of experience and not, you know, just be anxious to get everything down and write a book, the better that book is going to be. Um, and also, um, there's no more important thing you can do as a writer than rewrite, than look things over and and get a fresh eye on it and not be afraid to change things around and not you know think everything that you know comes out of you is perfect and you have to fight for it um I think you know sometimes things are better off being changed than fought for uh, especially after you have a little life experience and perspective yes um what's the best money you ever spent as a as a writer Sujata hands down traveling. So mm -hmm. uh, when I lived in Japan, I decided I'm going to take a trip all by myself back to the, the mountains, the Japanese Alps. And my husband was out at sea with the Navy. And that, mm -hmm. that does sound a little bit adventurous, you know, to go all by myself there. Um, but I wanted to know more about it because I was thinking about writing this, this the Salaman's Wife. And then also similarly, like valuing uh, and believing in my project enough that I would travel by myself to a country. And mm -hmm. often when I do these trips, especially with India and Japan in the beginning, I didn't have a lot of money for lodgings. I stayed with, with people I knew. I stayed in like almost, you know, quasi student kinds of places. And um, I think I got all the more enrichment because I stayed like that. Mm -hmm. Allison, what's the best money you spent as a writer? Um, I would say, you know, when I, um, I would, I would, after graduate school, when I was living in New York um, and working, uh, I took a uh, fiction writing workshop with Abigail Thomas, who's an amazing writer. She lives in Woodstock now, but she wrote the book, A Three Dog Life. And mm -hmm. I honestly think that if I hadn't taken that paid for and taken that workshop, which I kept signing up for again and again, um, I probably never would have finished a novel. Um, I, I think having not only that sort of advice from a really knowledgeable person um, and group of people where everybody's supportive of each other, but that encouragement of you can write a novel, this short story you wrote could be a novel, uh, that really, that made such a difference in my life. So I think finding the right uh, either class or workshop or, or something uh, at least for me, made a huge amount of difference. Allison, how old were you when you had that workshop experience? Oh, I was in my I was in my 20s, but then my first book wasn't published until I was 39. You know, I I, um, I rewrote um, I wrote a short story in that in that group, and I signed up for it for I was probably in it for about seven years, but I was like 25 or 26 when I started. And, um, and then I just kept, I, then I wrote something that was a novel and then it, it didn't sell. And then I 
went back and rewrote it from page one, but it was things that I learned in that workshop and sort of the discipline that I learned in that workshop and the idea that it was possible to do that, that, um, you know, it really, it made a huge amount of difference to me. I wasn't, I don't have my MFA. I have my master's in journalism and my undergraduate was in theater. So I never studied, like I, I took writing classes in college, but I wasn't a major in it. So having, you know, just that group where I was purely focused on writing was a new experience for me um, and, a, and a really worthwhile one. You know, I Someone thought... asked again, what is the name of the workshop that you took? Well, it was, it was with a woman by the name of Abigail Thomas, and she did it out of her apartment in New York. And I'm, mm -hmm. she, I, she doesn't do it anymore. She's published uh, several books since then. But uh, I would really recommend, if anybody's interested in memoir writing at all, or just wants to read a great memoir, she wrote a book called The Three Dog Life. Um, but she's, and also another, she's written several books, Safekeeping, A Three Dog Life. Um, and they're just, wonderful book. She is a wonderful writer. And uh, if you just, if you want to learn things about sort of the economy of prose and writing perfect sentences, and she gives great instruction as far as, you know, prompts and everything, but I'm singing the praises of a workshop that's no longer in existence. <laughs> but find a good one. There are many, many good ones out there. <laughs> I also want to add that I, well, I, I joined Sisters in Crime probably in 1994, mm -hmm. and that was, it might have been $50 a year, but that got me into a, a writing group, yes. a writing mm -hmm. group where I had to produce regularly, mm -hmm. and where people were smart and they understood mystery, so I finished that group, you know, my book with that group, and then I did take a writing course in the night school at Johns Hopkins, um, which is was open to anybody. Um, so I agree. I actually, I take back my earlier answer. I think that what I think <laughs> what is saying is really, really helpful that you, you need people around you, you need encouragement. Yes, you do need it. I am currently treasurer of the Sisters in Crime Treasure Coast, which is new. And it's a very easy job because we have no money. But I do feel, and I think you may too, that writers need to spend time with their own kind. And Sisters in Crime and other organizations help us do that. Now, uh, Allison, what's the first book that made you cry? Or if you didn't actually cry, you had a real emotional reaction to? Well, I'm sure there are a lot of books when I was a kid that did make me cry that I can't quite remember. But the first mm -hmm. book I remember like sobbing over was Of Human Bondage. And I cried on the first page. Mm -hmm. When I opened up that book, uh, reading the first page of that book about this wonderful character just made me cry. Um, so uh, that that's probably, uh, that's probably, that's the first book I can remember having a really emotional reaction to. Um, and there are other books I've been really intrigued by and, and you know, sort of dived into, but that, I, that had me sobbing, you know, so that's what I would say. Oh, actually, you know, also, um, I take it back before that, I cried <laughs> a bit over Great Expectations as well. Uh, okay. Terribly sorry for Pip. <laughs> So you don't have to take it back. <laughs> I don't take it back. I did cry over that, but before crying over of human bondage, I cried over the expectation. Okay. <laughs> Sujata, any books that really affected you emotionally? I remember um, when I read the diary of Anne Frank mm -hmm. and when I got to the end and Aww. it was, I think the very end of it is something like I have so much faith in people and it, and you know that her, it wasn't meant to be the end of the book. It was just all cut off. And so I was really, really upset as a young reader. First of all, that this was true. Well, I love that the, the I love that the diary was true. I, mm -hmm. I, I just thought it was so amazing to be able to read somebody's diary and to read about how they felt about the boy in their life and how they felt about that person's parents and all these the, just, I was so enamored of her and it was so unfair that she died. And so I was just stricken after reading that book. And um, it also, I became very fascinated with true stories. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that probably set me up for wanting to really know true stories and not just, not just read 
escapist novels. Yeah, she says, um, I, I feel that it's spring within me. That one, ki that killed me too. Okay, I'm changing mind. <laughs> so sorry, Van Frank. I cried. Yeah. This is all being recorded now. Remember that. <laughs> No, yeah, it's uh, heartbreaking. That's a that's a great choice, Sujata. Um, what do you owe the real people that you based your uh, characters on, Sujata? Do you feel that you owe anything to the memory of the two women lawyers that Praveen is based on? Well, I'm I'm very grateful. I think the the way that I express my gratitude is toward the Zoroastrian community in general mm -hmm. and. And, um, you know, that for being so generous to share with me, not being a Zoroastrian, that I, I don't know, I just, I just spend a lot of, I, I send books, I spend time, I, I just keep up personal relationships. Um, and, uh, you know, I just try to thank people where I can and acknowledgements. Historians help me a whole lot too. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I just, I don't know. There's not much more I can do than send a sign book and try to, you know, be as respectful as I can. And also, um, whenever I have questions and sometimes just in general, share what I'm writing to make sure that um, it's accurate and representative of the religious tradition. Okay. Anyone in particular that you feel you owe a debt to, Allison, when you write your books? Well, um, you know, I do speak to uh, people. I, I interview people for research. Um, I've interviewed a lot, you know, depending on if there's a police procedural element in my books, um, I've, I, I'll go, I'll, I visited the robbery and homicide division of the LAPD when I wrote um, What Remains of Me. Um, and for, you know, If I Die Tonight, for instance, takes place in a small town based on Rhinebeck, New York. So I got a tour of the Rhinebeck Police Department, you know, the, the, all those, the, all the people that are generous enough to spend time with me and, and give me, you know, some insight and take me on tours of places. I do, I send them books, I put them in the acknowledgments, um, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's tremendously generous of people to sort of tell you in, let you in on their lives. And, you know, even when I'm writing about a realtor, I'm not a realtor. I spoke to friends who are realtors. So, you know, bought them a few drinks, give them a signed book, put them in the acknowledgements, <laughs> uh, any other thing they want, I'm, I'm happy to do. I, I really, I really appreciate people telling me about their lives. So I don't have to just keep writing again and again about some, you know, boring um, woman living in Woodstock writing books. <laughs> 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 Do you think that your uh, journalism background helped you? Yes, I, I, I definitely do, do. I'm sure you do, Sujata. Yeah, yeah, I was talking about it yesterday, in fact, that I, I think it really um, trains you to look for details in the environment, um, to seek out accurate information and that comes through even if it's a fictional story if so many things are lifelike about it so uh, you know that, that that's extremely um that you know the reader feels it and the reader begins to trust you mm -hmm. yeah i think i think it makes you want to keep things real do your research also not be so quite so precious about your words. Um, if you work for a newspaper or a magazine or whatever, you have an editor, you know, over you, you've got to make a deadline. You've got to rewrite things. You cannot be precious about things. Uh, and it, uh, it, I feel like it, my journalistic experience has helped me to be more objective about my writing, to realize that there's always room for improvement and that I can mm -hmm. stand back go in there, edit, change, cut things, cut entire scenes if they don't work. Um, not the end of the world. You know, I'm not a conduit for, you know, a heavenly voice. I'm just a, a very imperfect writer. <laughs> <laughs> that can always, always room for improvement. <laughs> and what about how in, in journalism, when you're, you're writing an article, the beginning of your article, the lead 
It has to be snappy and bring people in. And mm-hmm. that's what you need to do at the beginning of a book. And that's what you need to do at the beginning of each chapter. Yeah, exactly. I think with both, I think sometimes when people are writing books, they forget that they're writing them for other people. You never forget that when you're writing an article, you know, that's mm-hmm. what, that's what it all is. You know, um, it's all communicating with other people, whether you're telling a fictional story or whether you're relaying a news event, it's the same thing. You've got to be clear and you've got to rope your reader in and and you've got to inform them and entertain them you know so yeah absolutely that's the challenge now uh have you i i imagine that most mystery writers read a lot i certainly do and i imagine you do too have you ever gotten reader's block where you just can't read another mystery nothing seems to appeal you put it back on the shelf Sujata, have you ever gone through that where you've got reader's block? Yeah, I, I have, but a lot of time my reader's block is toward the expensive rare books that I buy to help me with my research. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, you know, I will see something on, there's a site, I think it's called Abe Books. It's like an old site, you know, and, and mm-hmm. I, I, it's like, oh my gosh, I absolutely have to have this book on reproductive health of women in 1930s India. I just, I have to have this book. And then that book comes and it is so boring. And it's like, but I felt like I had to have that book for the fact. And I know if I read this book, I know I will be enriched by it. But a lot of the reading that I have is like that. It's mm-hmm. about, you know, it's right now I'm doing a lot of reading about sexual health. And unfortunately it is not sexy. <laughs> <laughs> It takes a special talent to make sex boring. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Carol, do you ever, uh, Carol, Allison, do you ever get reader's block? Um, Yes, I do. But I I also get sort of this I get a fear, especially when I'm, I'm very in the throes of working on a book, um, that if I read another crime fiction mystery book that I'm going to somehow absorb the style of that book and, and get away from my own style or just start doubting my own words because, you know, a lot of times you know, I'll, I'll be just so inspired by a lot of the crime fiction that, that I read. Um, but sometimes it's like I, when you're when I'm very close to deadline or, you know, maybe halfway through with a book, I can't really read any crime fiction books until I'm done. Uh, and then I, then I go crazy. So I don't know whether that's block next necessarily, or just trying to focus. And it's harder for me to focus on what I'm doing when I'm reading other stuff going, wow, that idea is a lot better than mine. <laughs> so yeah, I, think it, I think it's scary for me to read other Indian historical fiction. And now there's a lot of Indian historical fiction, because if I see an idea there that I've already been working on, then I feel bad. And I think, oh, do I have to change what I'm doing so people don't think I'm copying that person? So now I don't do it at all. And um, it, it, I just, so there are really talented writers like Abir Mukherjee and Nev March, who I actually, I wrote an endorsement for her first book, but it's like, I can't really just keep going in that vein because it, it hampers my creativity. But so, so wonderful to be able to read Allison, which is set here and it's so exciting and it's a page turner. And, um, you know, I, I love to have, I love that our field is so broad that I can still keep enjoying mysteries. And I do read historicals, but I will read a historical set in the US or set in England. Um, but I, I just have to, kind of keep my own little world separate but read you know broadly yeah that makes sense you don't want it to be sort of too close to home because then you it makes you sort of yeah you it it it, it uh, makes you feel a little bit less calm a little bit less confident in the ideas that you have so elaine you're muted oh no Elaine, just muted. You're muted. I know. There I can't. You know. Oh, here we go. Yeah, Sorry. You got it. <laughs> I had to mute myself because one of my neighbors was going by with a boat playing really loud music, and I didn't want it <laughs> <laughs> to get in the way. All right. 
<laughs> okay, a problem of living in Florida that I'm sure no one's going to feel too bad about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my uh, heart breaks for you, Elaine. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is the most difficult part of your artistic process, Allison? Um, any part that I'm involved in at the moment. <laughs> I was, I, but my first inclination was to say starting a book because I think that's when I'm sort of, um, as Sujata said, you wanna get that perfect beginning that sort of draws your readers in. I tend to rewrite my first chapters like 500 times before going on to the rest of the book. Um, I'm plagued with self-doubt. Do I really wanna jump into this? Do I really wanna get into this year long relationship with these characters and this story? And am I doing the right thing? And all those little sort of inner saboteurs kind of get to me when I'm starting a book that um, once I'm committed and I'm in the middle or I'm getting to the end, you know, there are other issues that are difficult in other ways. But I think at least having that pile of pages to sit on, it makes it a little bit, gives me a little bit more confidence. It's that, that early part, that figuring things out that can be very exhilarating, but I, I do find it the most difficult. Mm -hmm. Sujata, in your process, what do you find is, uh, is the hard part uh, of, of writing? I, I would say the terrifying middle of the book. Mm -hmm. And I take a long time to get there. I get caught up in my descriptions and all of a sudden I realize I've written 190 pages and the murder hasn't happened. <laughs> <laughs> that literally happened to me um, a few weeks ago. <laughs> then I thought like I lost my I had one of those things where my I like inadvertently touched the wrong um part of my keypad and the whole thing vanished oh. and then and of course you know how you're supposed to be backing up on zip drives and of course yeah. I hadn't been doing that because I yeah. thought oh I haven't even gotten to the murder yet but but um my husband helped me get that back oh thank you so I, did, I didn't lose my book but that really I just it made me realize I can't believe I'm this far already. So I think the middle is very hard for me. It's not. It's no trouble getting started. It's no trouble to write, uh, you know, an outline for my editor, but it's 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 the you know whatever the sixty percent of the book is hard to write. Allison, what's an early experience that you had where you learned that language had power? Oh, yeah, that's a really, that's an interesting question. And I've been, uh, you know, thinking about that. Um, I think, you know, very early on, um, you know, I, I've always, um, I've always liked to write sort of scary stories and, and, you know, things like that. And I, when I was probably in fourth or fifth grade, I wrote a story about somebody <laughs> about someone murdering their parents like it was just a <laughs> scary story and my teacher became was very concerned <laughs> about me like psychologically but I read a lot of Edgar Allan Poe and I really loved that type of sort of psychological horror and I was just trying to do that but um it, it you know words do have power <laughs> and that did <laughs> Um, I think the, I, you know, I think just trying to scare yourself versus being a, uh, a budding psychopath, there's a very fine line between those <laughs> things. And I, you know, I guess my fifth grade teacher was afraid that I had crossed it, but I didn't, I swear. <laughs> my parents weren't as concerned, but they did, you know, I was called in and it was, uh, it was interesting. You think you're just telling a story and they're just words. And then you're like, oh yeah, I guess that was rather disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Sujata? When did you find out that words had power? What Allison said is so interesting because I feel like my trajectory was set around the same age. <laughs> um, when I was in third and fourth grade, and this probably lasted through sixth grade, um, I would go, I had two younger sisters and they wanted me to tell them stories at night. So, and they shared a room, I had my own room. So mm -hmm. I would go into my sister's bedroom every night and I would tell each of the, I would customize a story for each of them in which they were the star of their story 
And these were usually very pleasant stories. They were feel good stories. They were relaxing stories. They were good stories to go to sleep in. Sometimes they were continuing. And, you know, when I think about the work that I do today, I think that I do in a way, like if Allison writes things that are supposed to scare you and make you tense, I think that my mysteries make you feel good. I mean, it's really weird, but I think that I don't, I actually don't like to be scared. I have a lot of trouble writing those scenes that are the standard for a mystery. It's like, it, that's like, it's really hard for me. And I, I feel like that there is a world also for stories that make you feel good. And I, and I started doing that at the same time. Interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's, it's like, I think, you know what, uh, I think if you're a, um, a schizophrenic that sets in when you're 18, so maybe if you're a, a, a budding a crime writer, you it sets in at 10 <laughs> or, or not. <nine>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many unfinished or half finished books do you have, Sujata? Um, probably three. Mm -hmm. um, like I have a couple of cool ideas that are also different Indian historical ideas that are partly written. Um, I once almost wrote a memoir about um, the adoption of my daughter, which I decided mm -hmm. I really did not like putting myself out there, um, or putting her mm -hmm. out there. So I abandoned that and it was, it just wasn't working. And especially if you don't want it, if you don't like to share like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, th so that's what I've got hidden. How about you, Allison? Um, actually, nothing that I'm interested in. I did write one, I did a long time ago, I wrote 180 pages of a book, but it was terrible and it, it doesn't exist anymore. I, you know, it's in a, it's in the, you know, it went in the, the garbage of my previous home. <laughs> um, but no, I don't, I actually don't. Um, I, uh, I have, you know, a little file of ideas that I haven't, you know, fully fleshed out, but I don't, I, I've never really, since then, I haven't started a book that didn't wind up getting finished. Okay. Um, so, Jonna, does writing energize you or exhaust you? Oh, well, if I, if I've actually written, I, it's like, <laughs> that's the thing, if I've actually written and accomplished, I feel so energized, I feel happy, I feel proud, I feel ready to take on the world like I I just feel so good um, and that's the kind of writing where I talk about where, where you go into the flow you're lost in the flow of story you don't want to stop you might laugh um, you, you it, it's just the most wonderful feeling Allison yeah, I think I, I feel like I genuinely, um, I feel depressed and at a loss if I'm not in the process of telling a story, you know, um, like Sujata was saying, I mean, I, there, there's no better feeling than that. There's no, nothing more exhilarating than to sort of have pushed that, that wheel and you're, and you're on it and you're on a roll and you're, you know, it's, it's a really wonderful feeling. And it's, I think it's why we write, you know, it's, there's a, there's a real, very intense, very, um, you know, organic desire that some of us have to tell stories, you know, and when we're doing it, it it's a fulfillment like unlike any other. Um, and when, when I'm at a loss or when I have a block or when I can't think of an idea, I genuinely feel pretty not, not right, not like myself. Mm -hmm. Now we have a question here from Mitch. He says, do you separate, do you do separate revisions for plot, for dialogue, for the character arc, or do you revise for multiple issues all at once? Um, I, I do, I do multiple issues at once. Um, there's a t usually a time factor involved when I'm doing revisions because um, I have a deadline, I've had deadlines on all my books you know, for the past several books. And, um, but I did, I, I do know writers that do like five different drafts, one for each thing, but I don't really look at a story like that. I look at it as sort of a whole thing. And so much of it is sort of intuitive. And, you know, um, I usually tend to resolve mostly a, a lot of, I, I look at my, 
my revisions with an eye towards pacing because pacing never comes out right for me in the first draft because I just want to get all the way through it. So I, I definitely pay attention to rhythm and pacing, but in the process of doing that, um, a lot of times you see things that are inconsistent as far as characterization goes or um, things that could be described more or less in terms of you know, setting or, um, or, or, you know, maybe a new idea for how something, how an event or how an action could play out. So it, it all ends up being the same. I mean, it, it all ends up going into that, that big revision. How do you do revisions, Sujata? Well, um, I revise as I'm going along, which I know is not popular advice. However, mm -hmm. I have this problem that I forget what I wrote the day before. <laughs> so I will write the same thing again. So when I start a writing session, I usually <laughs> go back five pages to see what I did so that I don't say the same thing again. And I might even find that I've said it and chop it out. It's like, that's the problem when you don't finish a scene and you pick up that scene again for mm -hmm. me that I would say the same thing again. That's my biggest problem. And then after I've done the first draft, when I'm going through it again, I do look at dialogue and dialogue tags um, because I tend to, to repeat dialogue tags. I also want to be really careful about adverbs because I do use adverbs and adverbs were really popular in, in fiction usage in the early 20th century. So I think it's okay to have some, but I don't want to have more than two on the same page. And mm -hmm. I certainly don't want to have the same one. So I do those kinds of linguistic, careful looking. I have to do that after the first draft is done. That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, do we have any other questions from readers, listeners that you would like to add? Okay, I'm going to ask one. What are common traps for, oh, first of all, someone wants to know what are dialogue tags, Sujata? Okay. Um, what's, okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you a dialogue tag. When can we go out to walk? Her eyes lit up with excitement. So the dialogue tag is not, Sujata said, it, it's mm -hmm. like, it's 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 like trying to give you a picture of what's going on or the mood that's connected to the the piece of dialogue. That's a dialogue tag. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Allison, what do you think are common traps for aspiring writers? Oh well, I think it comes back to what I was sort of saying before about um, about. I guess I guess you would say being um, just purely persistent without being flexible. So um, in other words, you know, there's this idea of I'm going to keep sending this thing out there until it gets published. I'm going to just send it out. It's perfect the way it is. I know it's perfect. It's great to have that confidence. It's wonderful. But unlike, say, acting, where you can't make yourself a foot taller if the character is a foot <laughs> taller, you can rewrite a book and you can make it more, you know, interesting or more appealing or, you know, more real or better paced. You can do that. So um, if you're sending out your book to 10 different agents, which, you know, I've, I've done in the past and, and if they're all giving you a similar um, amount of a similar type of criticism about that book, it might be really constructive criticism, it might be helpful, take that constructive criticism, be persistent, but also be willing to put in the work um, to make what you have to make your product as good as it can possibly be. So that I think that the trap is just sort of being a little bit inflexible. You know, you, you don't want to be totally flexible. You don't want to be like, okay, romances are selling. So I'm going to write a romance when I'm not a romance writer. You don't want to do that, you know, uh, but you do want to be the best you you can be. So, um, so don't be afraid of rewriting and changing and taking a little break and, and, you know, really looking at something objectively to try to make it good if it's not selling right away. Sujata, what advice would you have for aspiring? What do you think are traps for aspiring writers? Oh gosh, um, 
I, I'd agree that that idea of, 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 oh, what I, what I think is that I see sometimes is someone being so in love with the work of a particular writer that they try to write that kind of book. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, for example, a Sue Grafton, the next Sue Grafton. Um, and I think that, that it, you, you need to find what's unique about you and there is something unique about you and about maybe about your family and maybe about where you live. And those are the things that, that make a book different, that make a book marketable. Mm -hmm. Um, and really like writing out of your, your heritage, if you, if you can, is great. And whether that means that you went to some very, um, interesting, you know, Catholic, you had this really interesting Catholic school experience, or <laughs> whether it's, you know, you're, you live in Minnesota, but you're a native person, you know, you're not a Lutheran and you had this whole experience mm -hmm. like that. Um, whether you um, have spent a lot of time, you know, just in, in a particular small town that has its own history. Those are the things to value and to, to think about. Well, I've really enjoyed talking to you. We're down to just a few minutes. And uh, so I'd like to end with, uh, what are you working on now, Allison? I am working on a book. It's, it's still in the very early phases. My, as you know, my very favorite part of writing a book. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's a, um, uh, it's another sort of paranoid um, thriller. Uh, um, a lot. It's, it's not like The Collective, but it's um, the idea of uh, someone being the target of a group. Um, that's all I'm prepared to say about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sujata, what are you working on? Well, I'm writing a mystery about reproductive health. Remember how I mentioned that right. book? <laughs> and it sounds a little bit crazy, but, you know, abortion and accusing people of abortion was used as this weapon to destroy people's lives in India. And um, then there were all these issues with maternal health, which were really difficult that, you know, more than half of women died in childbirth. Mm -hmm. um, more than half of the babies that were born in Bombay were dead um, within a year of birth. Mm -hmm. And so there were all the, these kind of issues around women's health and women trying to build a hospital and the kind of like a mystery happening around these issues is, is something that I'm that I'm working on. Well, I we, I enjoy talking to both of you, and I'm getting uh, notes here from our listeners that they enjoyed listening to you. Um, and so, please, everyone, buy their books, buy my books, help the local bookstore, treat yourself. There's the conference bookstore link, and. Uh, Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Elaine. Yeah, Elaine, this was great. And thanks to the audience for sticking with us. It's a long day and I know there's a, still a lot of great stuff ahead. Yeah, thanks so much for coming and, and enjoy. <laughs> Stay safe, everyone. Goodbye.